Welcome to the Lens Set 177, and today uh, we are talking to Mr. Henry Brown. Those who don't remember, he was the former Assistant Commissioner of Police, and at the time of leaving the Fiji Police Force in 2016, he was the Chief of Intelligence and Investigations. Mr. Brown, you reside in Australia now, you are in Fiji. To begin with, uh, you left uh, the Fiji Police Force in 2016. Uh, could you explain under what circumstances was, uh, was your departure on? Uh, thank you, Anish. And thanks for having me. It's been a while. Yeah, I left in 2016. Um, and um, circumstances that was beyond my control. Uh, I had given 30 years to the police force. I not only served as the chief intelligence investigations, I held all the portfolios at the assistant commissioner level, chief operations, chief admin, Chief Planning, um, and then finally the Chief Investigation Intelligence. Um, there was a change in leadership, uh, as you are aware. Uh, we did not uh, sit or all got well with us. Um, certain allegations uh, were put to me um, without any... Um, it was not a written allegation, uh, just verbal. Nothing was given to me. And when I offered to resign, uh, it was refused. So I, I actually, I just had to resign under duress and move away. Um, so yeah, I moved. You are at peace now, uh, knowing that you have left the Fiji Police Force, you're living another life? I think I, I gave my all for the 30 years I was in the police. Um, I would have given more, but yeah, I'm at peace. I'm still a citizen of this country. I live in uh, Sydney, but I travel constantly to Fiji almost three times a year. I have got uh, investments here, uh, family here, so I'm still part of Fiji. Mm. You were the Chief of Intelligence and Investigation, so explain. Why was that role so important for the Fiji Police Force, or is important for the Fiji Police Force? When uh, Mr. Gronwell, uh, uh, Commissioner Gronwell uh, uh, took over, there was no post of uh, Chief Intel and Investigations. It was all under Chief Operation Officer. Uh, Commissioner Gronwell, in his wisdom, um, saw the need for having a separate Assistant Commissioner overlooking uh, the intelligence side of things, both criminal and security, mm. and also overseeing all major investigations, all investigations. Uh, so coming under one assistant commissioner was a bit too much. So he separated it, and then he appointed me. I was the chief admin officer at that time. And looking through all our CVs, and then he appointed me to that post. Mm. So basically I was overseeing all major investigations uh, and looking after all intelligence, both security and criminal. Mm. Uh, wh wh was it beneficial to have intelligence together with investigations under one person? Very beneficial, because intelligence is a very key component of investigations. Um, you cannot have investigation without intelligence. It always guides the investigations in the right directions mm. um, with a certain degree of certainty uh, you always get pushed to the right directions mm. intelligence is very important mm. uh, for, uh, as an outsider currently do you see a well-functioning fiji police force uh, under under circumstances they are operating well as far as i can see that they have maintained that uh, structure uh, that should all go well. I have not been able to read some of the, the work. Uh, in fact, since I left, I have stopped uh, reading, um, <coughs> going on police websites or, or reading news or even reading social media. Uh, thing. But uh, if they are maintaining the same structure, uh, it, it should all go well for the police force mm -hmm. going, going in the future. 
there's a there's a there's a whole cadre of uh, new 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 officers holding senior positions how how can a person who's been promoted to a senior position like acp crime intelligence hold the fort yeah, how can he or she prove himself yeah, actually, that, that this is one of those uh, things that uh, retiring at 55, especially for police officers, it takes away, it, you take away that experience with you. So the uh, police, in the police, most of the things you learn are on the job training. You learn from your seniors on top. You learn from the seniors, the ones above you. And they impart their knowledge and experience before they leave. But if they leave at 55, and then the upcoming so a bit slow, there's a huge vacuum in the middle. Um, they may fill that vacuum because I can see that most of those older ones uh, that joined before 87, 85, uh, all those have they've left now or will be retired by now. But they will find their way. Uh, the Fiji Police Force has a command group, uh, senior, senior officers, ACP level, who, who, who run the security of the country. Uh, why is it important to have the right person in that command group uh, uh, to ensure safety and security of the country? The command group actually sits and briefs uh, the commissioner um, in whatever um, you know medium they have, like f uh, daily or every second day or once a week that can uh, uh, ready the uh, commissioner for external briefing to the minister, to the prime minister, or even to the president if, if it needs arises. Mm. So it's very important that each command, each, each, each director, each assistant commissioner, they are really well versed with their functions. Mm. And they come and brief commissioner and keep him up to date. So that uh, everybody is um, well briefed from that decisions, fair and proper decisions are made, uh, proper utilization of resources. Mm. So it's important to have the right people sitting there. Mm. During your time, were, were there any cases of jealousy, backbiting within the command group or senior, senior management of the Fiji Police Force? Like, for example, if one wanted to get <laughs> promoted quickly, Let's bite, uh, bring that person down. Ah, oh, this is our age, old uh, sickness in the police. It's been there. Um, competition for positions, uh, nepotism creeps in. Who you know, it's always been there. Um, when we started having military uh, police commissioners, uh, this cycle got a bit uh, intensive. Uh, people try and outdo each other, uh, you know, people get sacked for uh, just having coffee with the wrong person at the wrong place, uh, people not attending prayer, prayer sessions, so people start snitching at each other. So that, that kind of become norm, like you just step onto each other to climb, and people were not promoted on merit. Um, you may have a sergeant sitting at a sergeant station level and do not know the sergeant's work, mm. then the rest of the people will suffer because the decision maker is not able to make the right decision. It's been a, it's been an old, old sickness in the force. I hope uh, Zuki in the best, we can weed this out. All the best. How, how, how can a senior police officer, an example of you, how did you command the respect of your subordinates who are walking below you? By displaying what, you know, they know what, they, they can see what you do. The command you give, the knowledge, the experience. If you do not have that, they will, you will not command respect. You know, you'll have to display that to the men. You have to be out there in the front. Uh, if you be a um, nine to five uh, officer, you will not get the respect. You'll be out in the field with them. Uh, the commissioner of police, currently we have an acting commissioner of police. Uh, 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 why is it important to have a good commissioner of police, as a substantive appointment, uh, so that the Fiji police force performs? Uh, Look, it's good for the force. It's good for the country. Um, it sets a platform for the commissioner um, as to his plans, as to how he's going to carry out his functions. If commissioner is appointed, he's given his KPIs. Uh, minister says, right, I need this, this, this reduction in crime, uh, more visibility, this and that. 
he comes to the office, sits down with his command group, mm -hmm. makes out a plan, and then uh, works it out. Right now, if he's acting, you he don't know you're coming or going, so you'll be listening. Um, it's very important. It kind of gives him uh, a foundation to work. Hanzuki um, is a good man. Uh, uh, I hope they give, whoever they give, uh, they make it soon. Mm. Uh, how important is how important is education or learning for senior officers uh, who are in the Fiji Police Force uh, in the command group? Do they have to be learning themselves, developing themselves? Uh? If they have reached up to the senior rank, it's important for them to undertake specialized courses, um, management courses. Uh, don't have to be in the tertiary university, but uh, other police uh, agencies they provide, um, other universities they police police courses. It's because this is a different world now. It's very modern. Uh, you, you need to have that knowledge. Um, you cannot have a um, your warriors at the bottom more knowledgeable than you. So it is important. Mm -hmm. And uh, the doors are always open by other agencies, partner agencies. They know that. Uh, it's always open. They just have to negotiate and pick the right courses. Um, I think right now important courses would be covert operational uh, courses for middle management. You know, looking 10 years coming mm. or 20 years coming. So they start preparing the younger officers mm. for leadership roles. Mm. You yourself have a master's, in, uh, master's degree in transnational crime, I understand. How did that uh, assist you in your role when you were there? Oh, I did. It was the uh, visionary of the commissioner of that time, uh, Henry Hughes. I did a master's degree in transnational crime prevention in Ulungong University. I um, did a diploma in um, 60 studies in, um, in Hawaii. Then I did a bit of a training in Israel on security and all those. So they invested in that. Uh, I was an inspector only then when I started doing all these courses, they started sending. So they already had a 10 year vision or 20 year vision for that. Mm. And really helps. Um, the master's program had all, all aspects of it, organized crime, uh, terrorism, financial crime, um, international cooperation, whole, whole lot. Mm. So when you come and sit here and start making decisions, it really helps. The Commission of Police uh, position was advertised recently. Did you apply? No, I did not. You have no inkling to come back and save the country? I carried that flag for 30 years. Uh, I think there's a new younger generation stand now to, to carry that flag. Um, but if they need any assistance in any other way, they know where to, who to ask, mm. they know where to contact me. Mm. Mr. Brown, we'll take a short break and after the break we will discuss the June 2004, the major drug bust that you and your officers carried out in Valelevu. Absolutely. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. Welcome back and today we are talking to Henry Brown, the former Assistant Commissioner of Police, uh, Chief of Intelligence and Investigations of the Fiji Police Force. Uh, Mr. Brown, you were there in June 2004 uh, when you led a uh, Fiji Police Force team. Uh, you worked with the Australian Police, I think, to conduct and successfully uh, detect the existence of a meth lab in Valilevu Suva. Just to begin with, uh, how was this uh, premises brought to the attention of the Fiji Police Force? Okay, Anish, thanks. To answer that question, I'll have to go uh, right at the beginning about this setup. In 2000, we um, seized about 250 kilos of heroin 
at the yacht club. Um, it was a joint operation also with the uh, Australian Federal Police. Um, subsequent to that uh, investigation, we found a stockpile up in Namandi, if you recall. At that same time, around that same time, there was a heroin cocaine seizure in Tonga, washing off the beach. And after a couple of months, give or take, there was a hard drug seizure also in Vanuatu. This is, this is around that time. So the uh, Pacific Island Chiefs of Police met that year and the following, decided to form a transnational crime unit. And it was supposed to be piloted in, in, in Fiji, mm -hmm. the first one. Um, and that time there was a, a political will also to, to fight this. So they had the vision already about 10, 20 years down the line mm -hmm. by, by recognizing the threat, you know, here, Tonga and Vanuatu. Because no, it's any minute now, any day now, it will escalate. So the Transnational Crime Unit was formed a joint team between customs and police. And it started with a proper training, uh, proper surveillance training, uh, analyst training. These few of us, and then we were moved out from the mainstream police stations and mainstream custom building. So we started uh, operating. Mm. We started looking at, uh, at um, companies, looking at uh, massage parlors, looking at uh, organizations which was dodgy, uh, visa records. We started uh, building up the profiles. It was 2002, building up all these profiles. Uh, especially that uh, involves border from one jurisdiction to another. Movement, that's dodgy. Especially that time, you recall, there were a lot of gambling going on in the here, super, uh, which were illegal at that time. We had a number of raids we conducted. Mm -hmm. So whilst we were building all this, we received a very, um, very critical information about a potential drug lab being set in one of the countries in the Pacific. It was necessary, didn't necessarily mean Fiji. In the, it was coded. And in, in the code it was said that it would be set up in a country of brown people. So we took, we took that intel and we started working on it. At the same time the boys were getting upskilled and trained. Mm. And we were out of the mainstream police stations and all, which was al already a, uh, becoming an issue because the police themselves start suspecting us what we were doing, because driving rental cars, growing beards and all those. But then suddenly it started taking form. Mm. Start taking form. People start coming. Good starts coming. So then we started talking to our partners, Australian Federal Police, New Zealand Police, Malaysian Police, Hong Kong. So this is this became a became a multifaceted, mm. you know, multidimensional uh, investigation. We're looking at the goods coming in. We're looking at the manpower coming in. The money movement started from Hong Kong, but the labors and everybody is coming out of Malaysia um, uh, in the equipment. So we started doing the surveillance around. Um, New Zealand, Australian Federal Police, um, uh, Malaysian Police, and Hong Kong. So it's just, that was a 13 month covert investigation, real painstaking. Sometimes we go about 13 hours, 16 hours. We go to sleep when they go to sleep. We wake up, so one of us has to wake up with them. So it was all control. Chemicals, machinery, all that came towards the lot of the beach. The only thing with this was just we keeping, keeping all our agencies really informed. So that do they do not jump the boat, we don't jump the boat here. Because we wanted to catch the big boys together, the money men mm. and the people here at the bottom of the food chain here. So it went on. And the good thing about this investigation was the direct 
reporting was to Deputy Commissioner and Commissioner, to the most driver and interviews. Nobody else. And it's very hard to do covert operations in Fiji, because everybody knows everybody. You, you're doing surveillance and somebody's talking to you. Mm. You know, like they know you. So this is how it happened. We, and that, at that time, the legislations were poor. We had the dangerous drug bill. Mm. The, it was weak. The sentences were weaker. At that time, the new bill was being tabled, and um, there were debate going in Parliament that too much power is being given to the law enforcement. Also, the situation at the, at the drug lab was getting a bit risky. We brought in a scientist from New Zealand, and that is, if this explodes, half of Suba is going. So we had to make a decision. And at the same time, our partners in Hong Kong, everybody was ready. So we had no choice. Mm. So we had to take them down. Mm. It was simultaneous raid. We raided here, they raided in Malaysia, they raided in China at the same time. Mm. So everybody was caught, money laundering there, and another lab in uh, Malaysia, and we did this big one here. Mm. You, men you mentioned a 13 month period of surveillance. Uh, does that mean the Fiji police force or the officers, you allowed the materials to come in and you allowed them to set up and you waited and waited and waited for the right time? Like I said, the legislation required us to have a complete product, a complete product before we would be charged. Mm. Otherwise, you would be just the charge for importing something, mm. uh, chemicals, ether and all those. Mm. If you want to get them, you want to get a complete product. Okay. So we had to have that little product they made, about five kilos, I think, yeah. How important was surveillance? You talked about surveillance, uh, uh, working long hours. Why, why was surveillance important and could you explain or could you give a background on what surveillance was involved? Surveillance is a key component of the investigations now, um, anywhere. E even us, we were utilized in robbery cases, some of the robbery cases in the West and here. When the robbery, uh, <coughs> the robbery offenses got a bit organized, there was an organized group doing robberies and all those. So they had to call us and then we go and, because you have to have, I'm not talking about one car following another car. I'm talking about fully functional, fully equipped uh, surveillance. You listening, you talking, you looking at the telephone, you analyzing the telephone numbers. There's many aspects of surveillance, uh, and it's very important to the part of the investigation. And it becomes a part of the evidence. Um, in my tenure, I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't noticed surveillance evidence yet to be admitted here in the, in the, in the court. I don't think we have come, there's become a need yet. But times are changing. Mm. So if one had to go to the Fiji police force, they would find video footage, uh, audio recordings of the surveillance of the people involved in the meth bust you did? They should, um, unless it's been destroyed. We had all the equipment, um, listening devices, um, cameras, lenses. Sorry, this is getting interesting. How, how did you manage to get the audio? Uh, no, we had, uh, we had uh, because like I said, when we were trained two weeks for surveillance, we had the Australian Federal Police um, staff come and train us. Mm. And look, they were part of it. They're always part of uh, Fiji Police, so uh, they always give us this um, mm. technical support. And I hope they keep continue to ask for technical courses. Mm. They're always happy to provide. As a former police officer of intelligence investigations, the recent meth bust in Neni, 4.1 tons. What's your take on it? Scary. It's scary. Uh, this is a different beast now. Uh, you see my backyard now. Um, I, I, to be honest, I, I do not know uh, much about that investigation. I only read whatever is is put on by the Fiji Times. But if it's in our backyard, the fight has just gone up tenfold. 
Um, maybe I'll explain later why the fight has gone up tenfold. Um, but it's scary. My thought initially, the sheer size of it is scary. Mm. Um, when I'll go back to my ca our cases in uh, in uh, Lodal Beach. After the completion of the case, I did a extensive uh, presentation of this course, many places. Pacific Chiefs of Police, a number of times. Uh, one or two MSG meetings. Uh, courses in National uh, in Canberra. Courses in uh, Brisbane. Number of courses in the Police Academy here. I am present in uh, Malaysia. I did presentation with, with the DE course, Middle Management. When they ran I course, uh, Drug Enforcement Agency in Maryland, mm -hmm. I was a guest presenter. My message always was that the, the doors have opened in the region now. Uh, it is the, the drugs, it will spill over to the locals. It will go on the local market. The byproduct of it, or the poor quality of it, it will seep through to the local market and we'll have problems. Mm -hmm. So whatever we're doing, we have to tighten it up. Mm -hmm. That was my, everywhere I presented, I said it. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, nobody would have thought that there is going to be a $1 billion drug lab. The Interpol that year classified it as the largest drug lab in the Southern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So the, the amount of, I did presentation on all those. Mm -hmm. Now having said that, referring to this one, that's why I said this is a different beast altogether. Mm -hmm. The fight has gone up tenfold. Mm -hmm. It would be naive, I'll repeat, it would be naive to think that this is only for transshipment. Mm. No say. It's all going to distribution also now. Mm. You know, if they're going to cut, if they're going to put in small packs, it's distribution. And it will surely seep down to the local markets. Mm. And once it goes to the local markets, what do you think will happen? Increase in violent crimes, increase in burglaries, mm. increase in what kind of people always start looking for money for drugs? You know, people always have domestic violence. People are looking for money if they get addicted or hooked. Um, then they'll have uh, somebody. I read in the paper one or two NGOs stood up and, uh, and said there'll be increase in child trafficking and all those. I totally agree. Offense against morality will increase. Prostitution. Child trafficking, people look for money, for drugs. Mm. Um, how do you stop it? You can't. You know, people will go crazy. Mm. If, you, if you were in charge of this nanny bust, would you have waited a little longer before carrying out that raid and getting people in? I'm not in charge, I'm not. And I, I do not know the inside of the investigation, so they must have a reason why they made that call. Mm. I would not, I'll not second guess that. Well, let me rephrase, was the timing of the raid correct? Look, if they raided, if they had the idea raided that it's the best interest of the drugs to be seized, they, so be it. Because in organized crime, I always thought, I always thought, it's, it's dismantled and disrupt first. Conviction, you know, you can get, get it. But you have to dis uh, disrupt the organization mm. because they are structured. You peel off the skin of an onion, one, tomorrow there will be another lot sitting there. You have to disrupt them. That's why I always multiface it. You know, multidimensional. You, you eat every way you can. Mm. Disrupt them. Mm. You know, don't just take them for possession. Take everything else. Whatever legislation you can throw at, throw at them. Because they have no mercy. This is for our children, the killing. So why should we have any saying this? So disrupt and dismantle them. Uh, if they made decision based on that, good on them. Um, what, see, the things I've outlined now, the offenses will go up. Mm. That's, for, that's, for, that's for looking for cash for drugs. Imagine people who are already on the drugs, 
and the offense is they commit. Mm. Yeah, they take a knife, cut your hand because they off, they hide. Mm. So they're still going. So let's let's mm. give them a chance. They're still going. You you spoke about during your 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 operation, your you your officers op operated in isolation, uh, yeah. reporting directly to the big bosses. And only recently, Mesake Wanga, the CID head in Fiji, has said they suspect police officers to be informants uh, of the drug 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 pushes. Is it that uh, is that is that something to be worried about? It's worrying. I, I read that some police officers scooped <laughs> some drugs and took off. <laughs> that's 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 really worrying. Like in front of your law enforcement. Mm. That's why it's always good to have uh, uh, covert, you know, controlled. Um, Misaka uh, is a trained officer. He, he was my junior. I know he trained under me. He is, he is good. But whatever he's saying is true. It was already there when I was there. Rogue police officers, mm. you know. Um, and the mentality of the police has changed over the period, over the period of time when the uh, commissioners changed. Commissioners who were not supposed to be commissioners, um, you know, sitting on the chair. Uh, commissioners who were not supposed to be commissioners running a police force when they do not know about the police force. All this is, this is a ramification of it all. Mm. Now you have uh, police officers who does things and thinks it's okay. Uh, you know, I'm talking about when I was there. I'm not pointing fingers now, they might be correcting, but it was there. I had to, we had to break up strike back team and all those. They had to, you know, uh, almost going rogue uh, and defiant. So it was coming into a line almost with uh, Commissioner Gronwell and then, and then, he got fired, mm. and I left, uh, and the rest is history. Mm. Finally, Mr. Brown, if you were to give some advice uh, to the Fiji police force on how to, on how to keep Fiji safe uh, in three areas, specific areas, what would those areas be, and how should they be doing it? I think three areas. Yeah. Top keep three, top three in your Keep Fiji safe. Look, it's for, 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 for drugs, particularly drugs, I know it's a difficult ask because of the first porous borders. Mm. Secondly, the cracks between interagencies. Mm. Uh, thirdly, the corruption rate. You know, mm. it makes your fight harder. So you have to fight that. Um, for generally, uh, and I don't want to be sounding too condescending here. Uh, nothing beats uh, boots on the ground and trusting the community. You know, you have to have people who can trust you and run up to you and say, boss, there's something wrong in that house. Boss, something is wrong in that car. You have to have that much trust, somebody saying, you know. If not, then you have an uphill battle. Um, I'll just make a f one more or two more comments. Uh, this is above police force. I'm saying this now. With this amount, uh, God forbid, there's no other drugs around somewhere. Mm. But as uh, you can see, I've been reading uh, the local news. They make a detection here, they make a detection there. So that means it's, it's readily available around here. And it will escalate. It's about time maybe the government start looking at the facilities. You know, we rehab facilities. We need to have rehab facilities because it come a time we'll have, uh, we'll have addicts, real bad addicts. You need to be ready for them. You need to have uh, mental hospitals ready, at least some capacity. Our corrections, like overseas, they have, uh, they have corrections, they have their own mental health wards. You can't just lock them and they were the key. Mm. There is uh, withdrawal programs, you know, legal drug withdrawal program, methadone and all those. They need to, they need to work this out now. It's a time they 
start looking five years down the line. Um, rehab. Some NGO is called about the rehab. I agree with her or him. <coughs> rehab uh, facilities, mental health, counseling. These three three posts. We cannot just be catching them, uh, possession, locking them. Because very soon we'll be catching them. They're too far deep gone. Mm. Yeah, and it will be problematic. Mm. Mr. Brown, thank you very much. I know you have a lot to talk about, but this is the only time we have to sit I'm very passionate about this. I can sit here and keep talking about this. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we don't have time. Thank you very much for speaking to me. Thank you.